Tonight, the phone call heard across the country. I don't want anybody to misinterpret that I don't care about those jobs. This is about the integrity of the government. Jody Wilson-Raybould's secret recording spells out her disagreement with the Prime Minister. What we learn, what it changes, and what comes next. Anger and confusion reign on what was supposed to have been Brexit Day. From the streets of the UK, we'll explain where things stand. It's not like I live in constant fear. I just, I'm just very aware of my environment, I guess. And checking in on Canadian astronaut David Saint-Jacques, a wide-ranging conversation from outer space. This is The National. Hello, Michael, it's Jody. Hi, sorry about the phone tag. So began the December phone call that in a concise 17 minutes gives Canadians a clear idea of the issues at the heart of the SNC-Lavalin controversy. Then Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould dialed it and knew she was recording it. The clerk of the Privy Council, Michael Warnick, answered and did not know it was being recorded. That audio, along with some 43 pages of documents, were given by Wilson-Raybould to the Commons Justice Committee. The documents add some new information to the story, and we're going to look at all that in a moment. But the phone call itself shows the stark difference of opinion between her and her boss, the Prime Minister, on just how to handle the SNC-Lavalin criminal case and just what really constitutes political interference. His view is he's not asking you to do anything appropriate or to interfere. He's asking you to use all of the tools that you lawfully have at your disposal. Um, I, 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 I know I have a tool under, under the Prosecution Act that I can use. I do not believe it is appropriate to use it in this case. Okay. All right. I mean, then that's, that's clear. Um, Does he understand the gravity of what this potentially could mean? This is not just about saving jobs. This is about interfering with one of our fundamental institutions. This is like but, breaching a constitutional principle of prosecutorial independence. So we oh, can. I don't think he sees it as bad. I mean, well, then nobody's explaining that to him, Michael. So how did that disagreement become the story that has gripped political Ottawa and many Canadians for so many weeks? A story that ended with two cabinet ministers, a senior advisor to the prime minister and the clerk of the Privy Council all resigning. The audio tells more, but so too do those new documents. And our Katie Simpson looks at both. Jody Wilson-Raybould expected this call to cross a line. And that's why she says she decided to secretly record her conversation with the clerk of the Privy Council, Michael Warnick. The PM uh, wants to be able to say um, uh, that he has tried everything he can, uh, you know, within, within a legitimate toolbox. As the Prime Minister's messenger, Wernick says Justin Trudeau is concerned about the criminal case against SNC-Lavalin and that a deferred prosecution agreement, or a DPA, could save jobs. You know, he doesn't want to do anything that's outside the box of what's legal or proper, um, but his understanding is, you know, the DPA tool is there. Uh, he, he just wants to understand more at this point why the DPA route isn't being um, taken up in this route. Wilson Raybould says she gets that jobs are important, but that is where any form of agreement ends. This is about the integrity of the Prime Minister and interference. There's no way that anybody would interpret this other than interference. She repeatedly argues a DPA would be inappropriate and her mind is made up. So we were treading on dangerous ground here, so I'm going to issue my stern warning. I can't act in a partisan way and it can't be politically motivated. Wilson-Raybould told the Justice Committee she was subjected to inappropriate pressure and veiled threats for her refusal to change her mind on this position. Though the tone in this call doesn't seem menacing, it is clear the two are deeply divided on what to do. In a pretty firm frame of mind about this though, so I'm a bit worried. 
bit worried about what? Well, I, 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 it's not a good idea for the Prime Minister and his Attorney General to be at loggerheads. Wilson Raybould says she feared this stalemate was the reason she was moved into the role of Veterans Minister. But in her new written submissions, she says Trudeau denied that. After much reflection, I decided to take the Prime Minister at his word, she wrote, though she also decided that she would immediately resign if the new Attorney General decided to issue a directive and grant SNC-Lavalin a DPA. While that has not happened, Wilson-Raybould says she left Cabinet anyway after Trudeau implied she was comfortable with how this affair unfolded. Uh, her presence in Cabinet uh, should actually speak for itself. Wilson-Raybould wrote she disagrees. I resigned the next day and trust my resignation also speaks for itself. All right, Katie is in the West Block tonight as MPs prepare to return there on Monday. Is PMO saying anything about all this tonight, Katie? The Prime Minister Rosie and his inner circle need to decide whether Jody Wilson-Raybould can stay in the party. And in a statement tonight, the Prime Minister's office says it is focused on moving forward as a team, so there's no change in the status there. The statement also says the Prime Minister was not fully briefed on the conversation in question and that he wishes Wilson-Raybould had gone to him directly with her concerns. Rosie. Okay. Katie Simpson on Parliament Hill for us again tonight. Thanks, Katie. Thanks. Now, as we said, that entire conversation between Wernick and Wilson Raybould runs for 17 minutes. Obviously, too long to play all of it in one show. But one more segment will give you a good sense of the tensions involved here. So this is for the record. Well, I, I feel that I'm giving him my best advice. And um, if he doesn't accept that advice, then it's his prerogative to do what he wants. But I am trying to protect the prime minister from um, political but interference he, or perceived or otherwise. Well, I understand that, but I, I mean, he doesn't have the power to do what he wants. Uh, all the tools are in your hands, so. <laughs> okay, so then, I, I mean, I, I'm having like, thoughts of like the Saturday night massacre here, Michael, like to be honest with you. And, and I don't, this is not a great place for me to be in. I don't relish being in this place, but what I am yeah. confident of is that I've given the prime minister my best advice to protect him and to protect the constitutional principle of prosecutorial independence. Okay. Um, all right, but I mean, I'm worried about a collision then because about this. I mean, I, I just saw him a few hours ago, and, and this, is, this is really important to him. And okay, um, I don't know. I just, I, there's not much more we can cover now. Then um, I understand where you're coming from. Uh, I'm waiting for the big, right. the other shoe to drop. So I'm not uh, under any illusion how. Um, the Prime Minister um, has and gets things that he wants. Let's bring in CBC National Affairs editor and host of CBC Radio's The House, Chris Hall, for more on this. Okay, Chris, what struck you about, about that audio recording? Well, the first thing, Rosie, was how carefully Michael Wernick was choosing his words, but he did underscore the things that Jody Wilson-Raybould had told the committee when she testified a month ago, that the prime minister wanted to know why a deferred prosecution wasn't being offered to SNC-Lavalin. He said he was looking for a way to get it done, and he was going to go outside uh, to find some advice. Uh, but then there's the other part of it. Jody Wilson-Raybould, we, we now know why she was recording the conversation in the first place. She mm -hmm. clearly didn't trust uh, the prime minister and his office and the clerk. Uh, now we understand that. And she wanted a record to be able to use as she is now. So, you know, she said people normally took notes of her important conversations. She was alone this time. This record is now out there for people to weigh. And she can see, and people can see if it, if it wraps up with what she said and what Gerald Butts said when he testified. Okay, so it, it's out there. There, and, and presumably nothing else is coming from Jody Wilson-Raybould anyway. So what should we be looking for next from the Liberals, the opposition? 
uh, we'll start how this with, is going to play out. Yeah. yeah, let's start with the conservatives and the other opposition parties, uh, the NDP in particular. Uh, they're going to want to hear from more of the people in the prime minister's office about their roles as she's outlined them uh, in this new material. But the liberals, I think, are the more interesting MPs to watch in all of this. There's already concern about the continued presence of Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott in caucus. I think the fact that they surreptitiously, that Jody Wilson-Raybould surreptitiously recorded mm -hmm. uh, the clerk undermines whatever trust may be left. That's certainly what MPs are suggesting to me. It will come up on Wednesday when caucus meets, Rosie. But as you know, there's some risk here. These are two very prominent former cabinet ministers, women who were brought into the Liberal Party, uh, and now they are on the outside and potentially going to be put out of caucus. They're also very important in the Indigenous reconciliation file. So I expect whatever happens, the prime minister will not be there on Wednesday. They'll want to put some distance between him uh, and the fact that as a feminist prime minister, these two women are not only not in his cabinet anymore, but they're also potentially not going to be in his caucus. Okay, Chris Hall, thanks for this. Appreciate thanks. it. So obviously, Andrew, this story, uh, weeks in, still not over yet. We'll see how all that unfolds next week. But political intrigue not limited to Canada's shores. Lots of rancor in a very different scale uh, in Britain's parliament. Yeah, Rosie, uh, lawmakers rejecting Prime Minister Theresa May's Brexit deal for a third time. Even a promise to resign wasn't enough to sway them. The implications of the House's decision are grave. The legal default now is that the United Kingdom is due to leave the European Union on the 12th of April in just 14 days' time. So this is serious, right? There are no easy alternatives. A longer extension from the EU is a long shot. But if that deadline comes and goes and there's a hard exit, the pound could take a beating, the economy could too, and all of it in the hands of a fractured parliament, its members at each other's throats. And remember, today was supposed to be the day. March 29th, Britain leaves the EU. Clearly not the case. And instead, all this time after Brexiteers had marked their calendars, who knows? But as Thomas Daigle shows us, for many, still, the only way forward is out. Like Brexit itself, this has been one long journey. A 450-kilometer march across England through the countryside towards London. For these leave voters, the finish line can't come soon enough and neither can Brexit. So that's it, forget the talks, we're out. I don't know how long it's gonna take, but we will keep fighting. Their destination, a divided parliament on the very day Britain was set to leave the EU. We were supposed to be having a party tonight, instead we're having a wake. What our politicians are saying to us is, shut up and sit down. The marchers picked up some friends along the way. Many thousands, like a crowd at a music festival, but the show's been postponed. Helicopters are hovering overhead. Police have closed down the street here. There's a real feeling of turmoil because of all the uncertainty about what could happen next. Brexit supporters feeling betrayed by their own government. You've ruined it. They've ruined it. Brexit! And as angry as ever at the EU. I feel blackmailed, like we've either had to accept the deal, the punitive deal that the European Union have laid before us on their terms, or nothing, there's no Brexit. They're completely out of touch with the common man in the street. Yes, some took extreme measures to show their rage, a sign the tipping point leading to deeper unrest may not be far off. It started with a vote three years ago, and support has slipped since then. With so many setbacks, they're losing patience, fearing they'll lose Brexit. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. Now, let's make one thing clear. This was always a decision teetering on the margins. All the way back in 2016, Britain's electorate voted just 52% in favor of leaving the European Union. Divisive then, and it's only unraveled further since. And as Margaret Evans tells us, that has taken a major toll. <laughs> March 29th, 2019, a day that was supposed to live on in either infamy or glory, depending on your point of view, of course, as Brexit Day, when Britain would finally leave the European Union deemed so odious to those leading the charge for the exit doors in a referendum nearly three years ago now. ...go down in our history as our Independence Day. 
Never mind, of course, that Britain actually joined the EU of its own free will back in 1973 and then confirmed it a few years later in, yes, a referendum. But make no mistake, for hardcore leavers, Brexit, if it happens, is akin to the great escape. But leaving isn't as easy as you might think, or as it was presented to voters back in 2016 and just about every day since. Because we're leaving the European Union on the 29th of March, 2019. Well, repeating it certainly hasn't made it so. After two years of negotiations and a few everything's all right attempts at distraction, Theresa May only managed to agree terms with the EU late last year, and no one seems to like them. That's despite a price tag of more than four billion pounds for Brexit preparations so far. But there have been other costs to this country, none bigger perhaps than to the credibility of the political classes, because Theresa May keeps talking about the will of the British people. But she's also been playing chicken with their representatives, running down the clock, say critics, and forcing MPs to choose between her deal or no deal at all. Kind of a Thelma and Louise moment, if you like. It all makes for confused viewing on the nightly news. While well, the Conservative MP Ben Bradley is in the House of Commons, he voted to remain, then became a Brexiteer, then voted against the deal, then voted for the deal, then said he'd struggle to back the deal again, but now says he will back the deal. Ben Bradley, why do you get to change your mind? I haven't changed my mind. It's all so surprising, unseemly and messy that it's easy to poke fun at. But the truth of the matter is that the destiny of a nation is at stake, its place in the world, its identity and its influence. And its people are exhausted by uncertainty and appalled by the performance of their leaders. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Margaret has a good sense of making sense of chaos. Ukrainian voters, meanwhile, will start to elect their new president on Sunday, and that's generating interest well beyond its borders. Russian state TV is giving it more coverage than the Russian election got last year. After all, Russian forces still occupy Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula, which they annexed in 2014. You can bet Canada's watching. It calls Russia's actions an illegal invasion. Just this month, the government extended Canada's mission to train and support Ukraine's defence force. And it's helping monitor Sunday's election for fairness. Fair play is not a given in Ukrainian politics. The interior minister has just accused this frontrunner of buying votes. He made the same accusation against the incumbent president, whom this artist depicts as the face of corruption. There's another frontrunner, though, who has no political ba baggage, and he's leading the pack. Our Moscow bureau chief, Chris Brown, shows us what makes him stand out. <laughs> In Ukraine's election, it's sometimes hard to know what's real or imaginary. This glorious moment has a school teacher winning the country's presidency in a TV show. And while the scene is made up, the program's servant of the people could very well turn out to be art imitating life. The program's star is comedian Vladimir Zelensky. And going into this weekend's real life presidential vote, polls have him in the lead. <laughs> this is a new face, he says. I've never been in politics, but people know me well. Zelensky is tapped into discontent aimed at political elites and oligarchs, who many blame for presiding over widespread corruption. It's a protest electorate. It's like the against everyone electorate. So Analyst Konstantin Fedorenko says younger voters especially seem prepared to overlook Zelensky's lack of political experience. Basically, if his voters come to vote on the election day, he's very likely to become president. The violent Maidan protests five years ago were supposed to usher in a political and economic reset as Ukrainians pivoted towards Europe, 
Russia responded by seizing Crimea and then fueled an insurgency in Ukraine's east that has seen more than 11,000 killed and counting. Incumbent Petro Poroshenko stresses his efforts to calm the conflict and that only he can stand up to Russia's president. Mr. Putin, do not expect us to give up, he told the crowd. But Poroshenko has suffered from an almost endless stream of corruption allegations involving him and his family that have put a second term in jeopardy. If no candidate gets a majority, then there'll be a runoff. So former Prime Minister Yulia Tymoshenko, who herself spent time in jail for corruption, believes she can vault over Poroshenko and into second place. We believe we'll win and the president and his criminal environment will be brought to justice. There has been progress on government transparency and Ukraine's economy is slowly growing, perhaps reasons to stay the course. But Vladimir Zelensky's strong showing suggests it's not happening nearly fast enough for many here. Chris Brown, CBC News in Kiev. And here are some of the other stories we're watching tonight. U.S. President Donald Trump threatening to shut down the country's southern border. We'll close it and we'll, we'll keep it closed for a long time. I'm not playing games. Mexico has to stop it. Trump is demanding Mexico completely and immediately stop all illegal immigration or else face a shutdown. In a tweet, though, Mexico's government responded, saying it does not act on the basis of threats. And worth noting, Trump has threatened to shut down the Mexico border before. Also, U.S. Attorney General William Barr says he's planning on making the Mueller report public within the next couple of weeks, by mid-April at the latest. Between now and then, he's working with Mueller himself to make the appropriate redactions and adds that neither Trump nor the White House will get an early look at the report before it's made public. Okay, still ahead, the story that I woke up to, Andrew. <laughs> White sands, blue skies, orange cat-shaped phones. Well, Garfield telephones have been washing up on a French beach for three decades. Yeah, that story's got everything, huh? <laughs> uh, and when all else fails, make a flowchart. Meet the man who's become a bit of a Brexit sensation by keeping all of it straight. We have everything tonight. Plus, we've always known Canadians were funny. Yeah, they make fun of us for saying about. No, I'm pretty sure Yanks make fun of us for saying a boot. Who says a boot? Ask a <laughs> Yank. <laughs> Why Canadian comedy is killing it on international TV, next. I feel good to be at this point in my career to have a show like Shit's Creek. That's Eugene Levy earlier this week on the red carpet at the Canadian Screen Awards Gala. Fans of the CBC comedy, though, were dealt a blow last week when Levy and his son Dan announced that next season would, in fact, be the last. And while many Canadian comedians have done really well in the U.S., the same can't really be said for Canadian-made comedies. Shit's Creek. Well, it changed all that, and it's leaving quite a legacy. Deanna Sumanak Johnson explains. We got those LA dates with when Dan and Eugene Levy asked him to take on Schitt's Creek, Brad Schwartz had a hunch. I didn't know it was going to blossom as huge as it did, but all of the pieces were there for something amazing. Hi, my name is Alexis Rose, represented by Alexis Rose Talent. Welcome, you! Whoa! What are you doing? Well, what are you doing? Blossom it did. From the New York Times, Vanity Fair, and Vulture raving about the show to the cast's live tour selling out in hours. We live in some dark times. There is some dark political climate. Audiences get to go to this joyous place that just makes you feel good and escape. So yes, that's, it's got comedy, it's got heart, it's got a lot of things, but it also has some Canadian joy to it. They make fun of us for saying about. No, I'm pretty sure Yanks make fun of us for saying a boot. Who says a boot? Ask a f***ing Yank. In another fictional Canadian country town, these characters are saying things Americans don't always understand, but they love it anyway. Hoser comedy Letterkenny has aired on Crave TV in Canada since 2016. In 2017, it started streaming on Hulu in the United States. And after warm critical and fan reception, Hulu just committed to airing four more seasons. We're getting into a... Uh, um, um, an era of television, especially in comedy, where it's becoming so niche and so particular that it's actually appealing to a lot more people as well. 
Rolling Stone's chief TV critic says American audiences are responding to the authenticity that comes through when Canadians are writing comedy with Canadian characters. We like specificity. People can recognize that. They can feel this, even if I'm not from there, even if I don't know this terminology, even if I don't know this place, I can tell this feels real to me. This feels like it's from somebody who knows it, and that makes everything feel a lot richer. Steppenwall doesn't see this Canadian invasion ending anytime soon. Working Moms and Kim's Convenience are also on Netflix in the U.S. now. And with Schitt's Creek going into its last season, Brad Schwartz is on the lookout for his next Canadian comedy. We live in a content explosion right now. There's so many platforms. Everyone's looking for content. And uh, oh my God, look at how look how well Schitt's Creek. Well, what else is up there? Okay, you boys. Ever the producers of Letterkenny Kenny just opened an LA office to try to push more Canadian content they have on the go, helping ensure that in the future Canadian comedies are as well known as Canadian comedians. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. And still ahead on The National, an interview that's out of this world. I was worried that I was going to miss nature and because we're living in this technical environment. But every day, looking at the earth from the cupola, poof, it's this, I mean, it's nature at its best. My interview with Canadian astronaut David Saint-Jacques is next. One week from today, Canadian astronaut David Saint-Jacques is scheduled to make his first spacewalk. For the past 117 days, he's been part of a NASA mission on the International Space Station orbiting 400 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Now, very recently, he and I had a chance to link up to talk, but know that his journey to get to this point was years in the making. In 2008, the Canadian Space Agency put out a call for its next generation of space explorers. There were more than 5,000 candidates. David Saint-Jacques was one of just two to make the final cut. I certainly dream of going onto the space station and conducting some experiments there. He spent years in training, but when it was nearing his time to blast off, there were complications. Two, one. This past October, a Soyuz rocket carrying an American and a Russian malfunctioned on its way to the International Space Station. It caused a dramatic crash landing, and for a time, Russia suspended all future launches, including St. Jacques. But after an investigation, his journey eventually got the go-ahead. He'd actually be the first to launch since the accident. And liftoff. We have liftoff. And in December, with the world watching, it went off without a hitch. He's now been on board the ISS for almost four months. Hello, Andrew. I have you loud and clear. We connected via Mission Control in Houston to check in on his journey. So uh, first of all, David, thanks so much for making the time to chat with us. This is very uh, exciting. Can I start by asking you how you've adjusted? You know, I mean, uh, to the work and to the routine, but also just something as simple as, as getting around. You know, it's, uh, it doesn't come, doesn't come quickly. It, uh, in my case, took several weeks. But uh, yes, I did uh, eventually adjust physically completely. And there's also some mental adjustments, psychological adjustments, uh, sense of disorientation initially, both in time and in space. Learning to fly has been the most important thing, I guess. Learning to you know, move around using your feet and your hands without breaking anything and uh, without taking anything off the walls. Initially, when you see rookies come in, we kind of very slowly move, and yet we bang things around. Now you kind of, without thinking about it, you just push yourself in the right direction and float through the modules. You have to learn not to lose things, because everything wants to fly away from you. Uh, so we have all these tricks. And then mentally, getting to get in the routine of staying in contact with people you love on the planet and remaining functional up here. All these things uh, take time. But thankfully, we have this overlapping system where we come on board, and there's always crews that have been here for several months and they just take us by the hand and hand us over the baton if you want. <laughs> you make it sound so simple. Uh, could you take a moment, though, to reflect perhaps on the road that brought you to where you, and that's very cool, by the way, uh, the road that brought you to where you are now. I mean, you look around and you think back to being a boy with, with dreams of being an astronaut to where you are today. Yeah, yeah my road started, uh, like everybody, as a young boy, you know, these dreams, I think, we should never forget that our, our main resource as a country is, uh, 
in the heads of our children. Uh, they are they hold our future. And so this dream for me has always been like a guiding, a vague, it's been like a star, like the North Star. The North Star, you, you never get there, but it can still be a guide, right? So I always thought space was an inspiration. I might never get there, it doesn't matter. At least it kind of gave me a path, it gave me a direction to follow. It gave me criteria to make decisions in life about what to do with my time on Earth. I was careful to make decisions that make me happy every time. And if you have to move, then you move and life will lead you where it, where it will. And if every choice was a good choice that made sense at the time, then the end result is a good result. You know, in, in an interview uh, some time ago, you mentioned that a skill you had to acquire to be an astronaut was, was how to think like an astronaut. But you said that while you're here on Earth. So, so now that you've had a few months up in space, I'm wondering if you can, you can explain that a bit for me. How does an astronaut think differently than anyone else? Well, maybe not differently than anyone else, but we, we think we have an operational mindset, which means that what we do here, you know, you see me here, I'm breathing, it's comfortable, good temperature, uh, the food is decent, we can sleep, but we are one technical problem away from being very uncomfortable, potentially, uh, or worse. Uh, and so you're constantly aware that you are living in a life support system and you have to be very careful everything you do. So there is a sense of a kind of a, if you want, respect for all the work that goes around us. And we are supported by thousands of people over dozens of years uh, to make this incredible life support system possible. The entire station is a one huge life support system. And we are kind of given the keys to the, the world's spacecraft. And uh, you gotta be responsible for it. You gotta uh, be very diligent. I mean, but isn't that terrifying in a way? I mean, I, and, and I'll give you an example. I mean, a month ago, you know, I understand a toilet leaked uh, on board, you know, something like 10 liters of water spilling out. Oh, we have a space plumber. Yes, the, the, the uh, only problem is I can't call a professional plumber if I need help. Oh, you are a professional. Call the ground. <laughs> you should have your toilet bag in about an hour. Here on Earth, we call that a bad afternoon, but to your point, on board the ISS, that's a potentially catastrophic problem. I mean, do you often think about just how, how fragile, the, the delicate nature of your mission? You know, it's interesting how the human mind works. I think uh, that uh, notion that uh, you're one, fa one problem away from, a, from being very uncomfortable, it kind of changed your mindset, but naturally you want to be at peace. You want, everybody wants to be peaceful. So we kind of change our, our set point. So, you know, it's not like I live in constant fear. I just, I'm just very aware of my environment, I guess I would say. That's what it does. It makes you very, very aware, acutely aware of everything. And as we get to know space station better and better, I mean, it's full of cables and machines, we kind of more and more efficiently notice whenever something is out of normal configuration. And that's, that's the best you can do. Uh. You also recently oversaw the successful docking of the SpaceX Dragon capsule with the International Space Station, which was, you know, a, a very real example of what future manned space travel could look like. And you were the first one to go inside the capsule. So I'm wondering, as you were doing that, what were you thinking? I was thinking about my procedures because I was doing some things that had never been done before. These procedures, the first time they were executed. Eastern Station on one, no two, forward hatch open. For me, certainly the first time for me. So I was just, I had, I had my operational hat on, if you want, making sure I was doing things the right way. And then, but when I opened the hatch, my the first thought that came to my mind was like, oh, wow, this looks different. You know what? I thought, oh, this looks like a business class uh, section <laughs> of an airplane. <laughs> but, okay, but, but I also, you know, I think of that and I think of Canada's uh, recent announcement about the Lunar Gateway Project, right? Having a space station orbit the moon. What is it that excites you most about the future of space? You know, it's a good question. I mean, I'm very excited about all these prospects of us continuing our, our inner desire to explore, expand our horizons and understand the world around us. I mean, that's what literally what got us out of the caves, through the plains, up the mountains, and then all the valley, on the oceans, in the air. And so there's that aspect. We have to continue to explore because that's in our nature and that's how we progress. You know, I think uh, it will never be the priority of humanity, of course. Priorities will always remain health, education, employment, security, peace, all that. But we have to keep a small fraction of our energy for blue sky dreaming, for 
the arts, for science, and for exploration, because that is how we grow. That is how we develop our civilization. So what excites me most is not the fact that we are going deeper into space, it's looking at my kids, knowing the fact that, yeah, Canada is continuing. Canada is keeping, uh, staying at the forefront of innovation, exploration. That's the kind of country that I'm proud to give to my kids. Because you know, these decisions on space projects, they're always for the next generation. It's decades away. That being said, um, do you miss home, David? Every day, every day. But you know, it's interesting. I was worried that I was gonna miss nature and because we're living in this technical environment, but every day looking at the earth from the cupola, poof, it's this, I mean, it's nature at its best. It's, it beats the view you have from any mountaintop, if you want. So uh, you are like in awe of natural beauty whenever you look outside the window to our planet. So that aspect is okay. But of course I miss the ones I love. I miss my wife, my children, my parents, my brothers, my friends. Um, I miss, uh, Everybody in Houston who have made it possible to bring me here, or people who have trained us, people who are constantly working diligently in mission control. I miss the community uh, of humans, but the connection is still there. We don't feel lonely. Uh, you just, I just wish I could uh, hug my kids from time to time. You know, uh, things like that, but we're not here forever. We'll be back. <laughs> and we'll be back with lots of stories to tell, and it, uh, it is a great adventure. Well, and, and humanity will welcome you back. Uh, David, what a wonderful opportunity it was to have this chat with you. Thank you so much for taking the time, and we wish you all the best. Thank you, Andrew. Bye, everybody. <laughs> so coolest interview you've ever done. <laughs> yeah, and then how about that ending, right? Just kind of blasts off in his face uh, while he's in space like Superman. Pretty cool. Totally normal. You win uh, interview of the year. <laughs> okay, still ahead on the national, our moment, the man who's helping sort out Brexit. We know how they vote. We know how they'll behave. We know what they want, mostly. And so I started to try to find a way of, could you predict what the next steps would be and what the outcomes would be in the Brexit process? Finding social media fame with a flow chart in our moment, but first. In case you missed it, on the beaches of Brittany, a decades-old mystery finally solved. If you're an 80s kid, ahem, or a parent of one, chances are you remember these. Garfield phones topped a lot of Christmas lists back in the day. But by the time the Tubby Tabby was a household name, the phones were inexplicably washing up here. C'est comme tout chasse au trésor. Le jour où on trouve le trésor futile, un trésor de déchets, eh bien, on est satisfait. An anti-litter group has been picking up the pieces for years. Last year, it used them as a symbol of plastic pollution. That triggered the memory of a local farmer who led them to the source. Là, on a un fil du téléphone Garfield qui est venu se ficher là et qui est resté. Inside this cave is a long lost shipping container that fell off a ship during a storm in the 80s and it's been lodged here ever since spitting out its novelty cargo. C'est un déchet qui a plus de 30 ans et on en retrouve encore des morceaux quasiment neufs. That's not likely to change. The cave is 30 meters deep, accessible only at low tide, and the container is right at the end of it, partially buried, which means Garfield could be causing trouble here for many years to come. They are places in BC where life moves a little more gently, a little more slowly. Places like Grace Islet or Musqueam Village. To live there is to be surrounded by mountains, water, the greens of moss and Douglas firs. But increasingly, property owners are discovering their piece of paradise may have a difficult backstory. There are thousands of sites in BC that are believed to be ancient First Nations burial grounds. Some are on private lands, and many Indigenous people believe these sites are sacred. That soil is the blood and body of that person that was buried there. Their DNA flows through me. Their blood flows through me. But the government doesn't see the burial sites the same way as registered cemeteries. And as Duncan McHugh explains, that's left all parties feeling frustrated and vulnerable. In the spectacular Chilliwack Valley. Oh, wow, what a nice day. Bo and Diane Sutton hoped to build their dream home. Good girl. 
Diane grew up in the area, yeah, raised her girl. kids here. Ready? So they bought this empty lot five years ago. But when they started clearing land, a neighbor who happened to be an archaeologist informed them these big hills might be graves. We didn't really realize what that would mean, though, and we didn't, had no clue. didn't realize the extent of it either. In fact, what locals call Mount Maguire is known to the Chilcoyak people as Tamahai, a transformer rock. And this is a place the Chilcoyak have long buried their dead. We'll stand at the bottom and you can get a little grasp at the size of these. Wow, right? wow, it is really big. Yeah. When Chief David Jimmy first visited, he felt the entire site should be preserved like a cemetery. And yeah, so we have mounds identified throughout this property. Uh, it's a sacred place. Um, development, absolutely not. Uh, there should be no shovels in the ground in this site. It's the kind of conflict that happens over and over again in British Columbia because ancient First Nations burial sites don't get the same legal protection as modern cemeteries. The province does keep a registry of indigenous graves and cultural sites, but even if it had been known there were graves here, it wouldn't be listed on land title documents. At the Suttons, a study by the First Nation revealed possible burial mounds all over the property and, turns out, the neighbor's land, too. After years of bureaucratic wrangling, archaeologists were called in. They confirmed this site as a grave, and this winter, much of the three lots were declared an archaeological site. There's no, compens There's no compensation. There's Which no, means no the Suttons can't dig anywhere without paying for an archaeological assessment and they face huge fines if any artifacts are destroyed. The longer we were in it, the more we realized that it was pretty much the Heritage Conservation Act that was basically allowing the government to um, cover their own butts. Uh, that's the uh, mound in question. For one meter around, we're not supposed to uh, touch anything, like no digging or anything like that. Realtors have told Ed Tucker and his wife their home, assessed at nearly $600,000, may be impossible to sell. We should have some kind of compensation and protection. Right now, there's no protection whatsoever for private property owners. This is the, the major sized one, and this one, this one spans both properties. Same story for Mike and Bev Prevost. Their life savings are tied up here. It is very difficult because we feel like we're caught between a rock and a hard place. They want the government to buy them out, but have received no offers. We're not the only people that this is happening to, and we won't be the only people that this will happen to. The focal point for the tribe was at Chilliwack Lake. The Chilquayak chief agrees there are more graves and cultural sites all over their territory and believe believes they're in danger of desecration if private property owners aren't compensated. At the end of the day, it comes down to protection of, you know, remains, protection of a cultural site. Um, and unfortunately, the homeowners that are out of, out of pocket or trying to figure out their next steps, um, there needs to be an adequate process in dealing with and supporting them through it. And the government says it's working on it. There have been cases in the past where uh, compensation has occurred. That's been on an ad hoc basis. Uh, we want to get away from that and work towards an overall plan. Here's some of the documents that we have. But the Suttons feel they have no alternative. They're going to court, suing for compensation. So the people that are purchasing property, you really need to know that there is a potential bottomless pit of hell that you could be getting into. Yeah, uh, it's crazy. And they'll keep working with the Chilquayak tribe, asking for changes to a law that leaves indigenous graves and landowners vulnerable. Duncan McHugh, yeah. CBC News, Chilliwack Valley, BC. Still ahead, our moment. Meet the flowchart guy who tries to keep Brexit straight for all of us. Next.
Okay, so if the Brexit story is taking you for like a two-year spin, you are not alone. It seems to have confounded everyone, British MPs included. But as it nears its crescendo, there is new hope. A German-based communications expert who's taken to sorting through the potential outcomes. And John Worth is doing it with flow charts like this one, 27 of them uh, just since January. John makes them in his free time, but now he's finding that they're taking just like too much time and he's tired. Today, on March 29th, the day Britain was supposed to leave the EU, the Brexit flowchart guy is our moment. I'm actually in the cloakroom of a nightclub uh, doing this because all of the British in Berlin are having a party tonight. I didn't know quite what I was starting, I must say, at the beginning. Um, and then what, what essentially happened, and people are beginning, well, like, hang on a minute, we don't understand that. And people, hang on a minute, this is quite useful. And then people kept on requesting, but where's the latest diagram? And so therefore, and then they've, they've, I've got this kind of following on Twitter now of people who are very keen to see the next outcome. The, um, the thing is, is ultimately, I can't keep on doing this at this degree of intensity, simply because I'm spending far too much time making diagrams. So I'm not gonna take a step back from all of this, but I hope I'll have to make a diagram only once every one or two weeks instead of once every one or two days. Sometimes there's been two or three versions in the same day when commentators are basically going, hang on a minute, but your probability there is wrong or you forgot an option or suddenly a vote happens or something. So sometimes there'd be multiple versions. Uh, and I also I get lots of feedback, particularly via Twitter, of, what, of, of how I map it. Um, and, and that then goes into the next version. <laughs> well, well, if he's done, then I'm done, Rosie. I, <laughs> I'm not going to bother making sense of Brexit <laughs> if he's not going to put in the work. Uh, <laughs> but I guess, so the important bit of context yeah. here, lest people think that this is like his insane hobby, uh, it's actually sort of related to his work. I guess in his communications company, he, he, he deals with a lot of political types, and so this is something that he reads up on anyway. <laughs> That's a relief, because like, that was just something I had to sketch out. I would not be good with that. And I guess MPs are using it too. He's seen evidence that they have these flowcharts on their desk because they don't know what's going to happen next either. It is a complex situation that, hey, requires a flowchart from time Apparently. to time. That's The <laughs> National for this Friday, March 29th. Have a good night. Good night.